Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. I find it difficult to believe that 2014 is already here. I find it difficult to believe that uh, these years are rolling on so, seem so quickly. And they say, of course, that the older you get, the faster the years seem to go. Now, I know I'm not uh, perhaps quite as old as some of you, but boy, oh boy, do they seem to be rolling on fast. So either I'm aging quickly, um, or for some of you, it must seem even faster, I think. But um, there's definitely something in that, though, isn't there? That, that time seems to just, I mean, it doesn't seem possible that... You know, a year has gone since we were, were at this position last year. It only seems like yesterday. And to be perfectly honest, it doesn't really seem that long ago since the turn of the millennium. And uh, all the hype around, you know, what's going to happen when the year 2000 arrives and with Y2K, etc. Um, so, you know, and here we are, you know, 2014. Well, one thing is for certain, time's not going to go backwards. It's only going to go forwards. But we can learn from history. And as we look backwards, we learn certain things, don't we? And uh, we can project those forward. Some people see um, uh, life as being like a circle, that history repeats itself, we say. And it's certainly true, isn't it, that there are events in history that come uh, up from time to time. They repeat themselves again and again. And uh, for others, they see history as being just a line. It's just a line of events going from one place to another. And I think that we can see that too, because as Christian people, that we uh, have this book we call the Bible that we use, and it shows a line of events. And even though, even in the Bible, it seems that history repeats itself, and sometimes we call that foreshadowing, certain things that happen... And we say that that is a foreshadow of something that is to come. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of like um, David becomes um, a foreshadow of Christ, for example. And so, uh, so we see that. And uh, in the prophecies about David, things that are said about him specifically, and yet some parts of them we look at and say, but that can't be right about David exactly. Because, uh, for example, it talks about uh, David when he gets the throne, that the anointing comes upon David, and uh, it speaks about him having a descendant or a son who will be on the throne. Solomon came to the throne. Solomon full of wisdom. Solomon who became a great king. Solomon who brought Israel's empire to its greatest height in all time. And yet... He didn't sit on the throne forever. Like all the other kings, he died. It's one of the things when you look through the Bible and you might sort of wonder sometimes, what is the point of the book of Kings, for example? It gives you the lives of the kings. So-and-so came to the throne when he was 23 years of old. And uh, he reigned for 14 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and then he died. You know, stuff like that, you know. And you think... What's the point? Why do we have these things? Well, the thing is that with every king, with every reign, as, as it's depicted in Scripture, and it tells you it's a little summary of their history, it always finishes up with that line, and then he died. Israel was looking for the eternal king. And it tells you about the next king, and then he died, and the next king, and then he died, and the next king, and then he died. And then he died. And then, of course, we have the story of Jesus. Jesus, the king, of course. He was born. We've just been celebrating Christmas. Jesus was the king who was born king of the Jews. Herod got scared. 
So he did a most terrible atrocity. So insecure was the king, an Edomite, a descendant of Esau. Esau was always the enemy of God's people. Read the book of Obadiah. It's a judgment on Edom for what they've done to God's people. Read the book of Amos. He has judgments on the nations all around Israel. When it comes to Edom, what have they done? They've attacked Jacob. Now there's a king sitting on the throne of Israel called Herod, an Edomite. Surely he can't be the king. And he's insecure about this. And so he has all the children under the age of two killed, put to the sword because of his own securities in a particular vicinity where he believes that Jesus, this king of the Jews, might have been born. Jesus goes through his life and he'd never lived in a palace He never assumed any um, royal airs about him. He was a very humble man, very down to earth. And yet he showed us that he was also God. And then they hung him on a cross and had put above him a label, the king of the Jews, his crime. That's what those labels were. This is the crime. This is why this person is hanging on this cross. Not because he was a murderer. Because he wasn't, of course. Not because he was some kind of insurrectionist. Because he wasn't that either. The charge they found was king of the Jews. And there he hung with his crown, not of gold, but of thorns. So the life of Jesus finishes, does it not, with, and then he died. Well, it would do if the story stopped there, but it doesn't. The story continues. And then he rose again. Until finally, we come to this point at the very end of his life, as Matthew records it, that he take, gathers his 11 disciples together on a particular mountain, just for before his ascension, and just as he's going up into heaven, he gives them some final instructions, the Great Commission, go out into all the world and preach the good news, teaching people to obey me, baptizing them, etc., etc. You know it well. And then he says something at the end, which only a living soul could say. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Go and establish my kingdom. I am your king. And I'm not dead. I'm alive. The book of Revelation has those words. He says that I am he that lives forever and ever. He is the living king. But I want to come back for a moment to the shepherd king. Jesus, of course, was also a shepherd king in a way, but the one we think of most of all as being the shepherd king is David. And we read perhaps David's most famous piece of writing earlier in our service today, Psalm 23. And here as the shepherd, I'm not sure that he was king at this stage, but um, he was certainly the shepherd. He understood his sheep and there he was out in the hills with his sheep, grazing them, looking after them, protecting them, making sure they had everything they need and he would sit there and make up songs as he worshipped the Lord. And this one has caught our imagination more than any of the others. But I want you to notice what he says in the fourth verse. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
Well, he clearly takes some of the instruments of his own profession and he applies them to God. And he says it's just like God is, is like the shepherd. And later, of course, Jesus is described as the great shepherd, as well as the good shepherd, of course. But he says it's just like he's got a rod and staff. And David knew full well that he had to use those things in the management of his sheep. And he says, it's just like the Lord has those things. And I feel safe because they are in his hands. I feel safe because as I go through life, I know that, as he says here, for you are with me. Now, these words are recurring throughout Scripture. Again and again, the Lord says those words, I am with you. All sorts of times and occasions, I am with you. Jesus told his disciples as he went, I am with you. To the very end of the age. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Says another passage repeated in the new from the old. There are times when God has taken his people. He took Abraham. And he assured Abraham. That wherever he went he says I'm going to give you the land. In other words he says I'm going to be with you. You just go into the land, he says, you walk around, he says, and this is the land that I'm going to give to you. Abraham never received it. He believed by faith. Later on, we find that Moses was given assurance that the Lord was going to be with him when he had to go and rescue his people. Moses had severe misgivings about this. He was really unsure. But the Lord promised him, he said, I will be with you. I'll prove it to you even. Take this staff, Aaron's staff. So see what it does. Throw it on the ground and it turned into a snake. He says, if this is an evidence that I'm here and I'm going to go with you, nothing is. And at various times as the children of Israel came out of their captivity and went towards the promised land, so they were reminded again and again, I am with you. Joshua takes over from Moses, and the Lord assures him that he says, I'm staying here, I'm going nowhere. David had the assurance, I'm going nowhere, I'm still with you. Even when God's people sinned and God found it necessary to punish them and when God punished his people as a nation that usually meant exile and captivity and and that war was going to come against them had God abandoned his people not for one minute God didn't abandon them but he says I need to do something to bring you back to me because I'm with you but you're not with me he says I need to shake you up and so therefore he allowed his people to go through some very testing times. But not once did he leave them. And sure enough, God proved that after 70 years of captivity. And he told Jeremiah, even before they were taken into captivity, he says to Jeremiah, 70 years. And he says, I'm going to bring my people back. 65 years after they were taken into captivity, Daniel is studying the scriptures and reading presumably Jeremiah, when he realizes that there's only five years to go and the captivity is over. And it was Daniel who realized, and let's face it, if anyone knew that God was with him, it must have been Daniel and his friends, of course. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in the fire. But then there's a fourth character with them. Daniel finds himself in the lion's den, and yet the lion's mouths are kept shut. Why? Because God was with them. He's been faithful to them. And God, who's faithful to his people, says, your time of hard service is over. I'm going to return you back to your land. And he brings the people out of captivity and back into the land again. And then our favorite 
of all the minor prophets has to be Haggai. And several times in the book of Haggai, as the people began even in those early days of rebuilding the temple, they lost the heart for it. And they had to be reminded through the prophet Haggai, I am with you. Several times, I am with you. Get on and work, for I am with you. I've not abandoned you. You're not doing this on your own. You're doing this with me, with my help. Seems to me that as we go through life, that we also have that testimony. The Lord says, I am with you. Some of you have been through some pretty hard times. Perhaps over the last few years, times have got difficult. Why? Always a good question. Not always an easy one to answer. Why does this happen? Well, of course, God's people found themselves in difficult times because of their disobedience. Because they had turned from the Lord, so he brought punishment on them. Therefore, should we conclude that every time we come under trial, that God must be punishing me for something? Well, no, it doesn't work like that. God's people, it was a, 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 you know, not unique situation, but certainly a very specific situation. But many of us come under trials and troubles in our lives for other reasons. Sometimes it's because of that thing called Anno Domini. The years pass by, we've said how quickly the years are going. And as we get older, we begin to realize our humanity and our frailty. And with that comes all sorts of problems. That's all because of sin, yes, but not directly your sin. That's because the human race fell, because we're no longer immortal, but mortal. Because we have a set time on this earth. Because these bodies of ours are not going to last forever. But the great hope of the Christian is that one day we will be restored and that we will receive a new body when Jesus returns. One that will not be subject to the aches and pains that perhaps you're feeling at the moment. One that will not be subject to decay. One that will not be subject to death. It will be like Jesus' body, a resurrection body that goes on forever. Some of us will find that our troubles are caused because of what other people have done. Some of us may find that the difficulties we go through may actually be down to some of the things that we've done, choices we've made. They may have been bad choices, but... They may not have been uh, necessarily your fault, the choices you made. Sometimes we have to make choices quite blindly. But what I do know is this, that through it all, the Lord is with you. What difference does that make? And that's an important question for us to ask because we could say, hang on a minute. Therefore, if I go through the same things that everybody else goes through, If I get the aches and pains like they do, if I get the the kind of physical restraints on my body like everybody else finds, if I can go through financial hardships like everybody else goes through, if I can suffer at the hands of the elements just like anybody else can suffer at the hands of the element, what is the point? Why am I a Christian? Why do I say God is with me? What difference does it make that God is with me? And clearly the answer has to be that when God is with us, it it makes such a difference to our whole attitude. You can do whatever you like to me, but I know my future is secure. And I know that some people will throw back at me and say, hang on a minute, but then what use is salvation now? Why don't we just wait to the last minute? Well, you know, I believe he does make a difference because I believe that as a follower of the Lord... It makes a difference to our attitudes. makes us different to how we approach other people who are in suffering. It gives us a heart of compassion that we wouldn't be able to have, perhaps, 
without him. Helps us to put things into perspective. I think when we think about Jesus himself and all that he suffered, we have to look in our own lives and say that actually any suffering that we have is, well, just pales into insignificance compared to what he went through. So as we go into a new year, we go in blind. We don't know what's ahead of us. We have no guarantees for the weeks and the months ahead. Some of you will perhaps be going in a little nervously. Maybe there are things that give you good reason to be nervous. Don't be afraid, I believe the Lord would say. Some of you, of course, will be going in with great optimism. And that's wonderful. Always good to go through with optimism, isn't it? Entering a new year. Lots of things, positive things ahead. Lots of plans, good things to come. Keep that optimism. That's always good. But remember that God is with you through it all. Remember that everything you do is to be done for his glory. That nothing you do should be to his shame. But of course, we have to face reality. David in his psalm begins verse 4 with, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't mean literally, I'm about to die. That's not what he meant. Because if he did, he was wrong. Because we know that he lived for a good number of years after he wrote this psalm. What he's saying is this, that this shadow of death, which was probably uh, a, a very real shadow that was being cast but he's using it poetically what he means is this that always always hanging over us is the shadow of disaster I don't want to be pessimistic but it's reality we hope for something positive and good but there's always the shadow of something not so good coming our way. And he says, I will not fear, for you are with me. You see, the Lord strengthens us through even the worst of times. The testimonies that we can have of when we do go through the hard times, that it was the Lord who gave me strength, the Lord who gave me something positive, the Lord who put a spring back into my step, the Lord who helped me when I felt that I was at my wit's end and couldn't go any further. He's the one who picked me up. The Lord makes such a difference to us. But I want to add, I believe, there's a proviso to it. The Lord doesn't guarantee that everything will be good and well for any of us. But I do believe that there is a special blessing upon those who stay close to the Lord. If you wander away, if a sheep wanders away from the shepherd, it's likely to come into danger. The shepherd may have his, his rod on his staff, but if you've wandered away out of reach of those, what use will they be? We need to stand within the shadow of the Lord himself, never far from him, always being able to hear his voice, always able to feel his touch. And as we move out of that area, out of that safety, as we get curious and move further away from him, we open ourselves to dangers. doesn't mean to say the Lord has left us, but we have left him. Be careful to stay close to him. I want to just conclude really this morning by reiterating and reminding you that in everything you do, if you stay close to him, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. He is with you. He's never going to leave you. Give thanks for that. And make it, I'm not a great believer in New Year's resolutions, but if there is a resolution you're going to make this year, make it this one. 
that you will do everything within your power to be close and closer to him. Let's pray.